Hello and welcome or welcome back. I've got another quick video for you today. You know, lately I've been doing these short sort of one-offs and it seems like everyone has been enjoying them. I've certainly been enjoying making them, so we're going to keep that train moving. Today I want to talk about signals, and this is not going to be your standard how signals work tutorial. I want to cover five perhaps lesser discussed ways people use signals. If you're new to signals, don't worry, this will still be valuable to you. If you're not, hopefully you learned something new. So why do people use signals? Well, largely they allow you to create separate systems that can still communicate and react to what other systems are doing, but they don't have to worry about being dependent upon those systems. So you can move your code around, refactor things, and your project won't break, hopefully. With that said, let's look at the first thing, which is binding. So when you connect to a signal, you can use this bind method to pass an argument along with the signal. In this example, I'm using it to simplify my start menu code. A standard setup might look more like this, where you have a signal for each button. In this case, I have one signal that all of the buttons connect to, and then I'm passing the caller along through bind as a way to match which button was pressed. While this example may not be a total game changer, I like a few things. One, I'm not using the interface to wire stuff up so I can see all of my logic at a glance, but also once it's written, I can collapse it and not worry about it, where as in the traditional method, I've got more things to collapse, I've got hidden stuff that I gotta click into to understand completely. The other thing bind is really helpful for is if you're instantiating stuff at runtime and need to pass additional data along when you connect via code. The next thing I'd like to look at is using Lambda functions to bubble signals up through your scene tree. Let's pretend I've got this player character and on it is this power up component. So this component's only job is to report when we stepped on a power up and let the hero know. But what if we've got a level or other systems that want to know about these power ups as well? It's easy enough for the hero to know about this because it's an immediate child and we can connect through an on ready variable and listen for those signals directly. But if we've got a level that holds our hero or something even further above that, it might be a little trickier to connect to those signals. So one thing we can do is repeat those signals in our hero class. See, these are the identical signatures. And then down here in our ready function, I'm using lambda functions to essentially re-emit that signal in one line of code. If you've never seen a lambda function, it has no function name, it can take arguments, and then the body is right here and it can be passed along as an argument. So we're connecting to our power up started signal on our power up, and then we're just re-emitting that signal. This is effectively the same as doing this, but in one line of code. Now that we've got our hero re-emitting that signal, from our level, we can do something like this. This solves the problem of having to drill all the way in to that power up node. And in some cases, bubbling a signal up like that doesn't cut it either. In those scenarios, the event or signal bus pattern often comes in handy. This pattern uses an autoload to define the signal signatures, and because autoloads are globally accessible, you can listen for and react to signals defined on it from anywhere within your game. To create one, you would go File, New Script. You want Inherent from Node. We're going to call this script Events. And then in our project settings, we're going to make sure we go to the auto load tab. We're going to add our new event script. We're going to leave it default set to events and click add. Now, instead of defining signals and connecting to them directly on individual nodes or objects, we can do stuff like this. Inside of events, we're going to define this language change signature that's going to pass along the language ID. And then let's pop over to our settings menu. We've got this language drop down, and anytime that changed, we want text all over the game to be able to react to that change. So in our script, where our drop down changes, we're going to call events.languagechange.emit. We're going to pass along the newly selected language. Now, anywhere else in our project, let's say the start screen, where we have buttons with text on them, we might want to be able to listen to that change so that we can update the text on the buttons. So we can say events.languagechange.connect handle language changed, and then we'll need to define that handler, which will look like this. 
we're not going to actually implement the logic. But now you'll see if I run this project from the start screen, open the settings page, and change the language, the start screen is now reacting to that signal. Moving on. This is something that isn't technically a signal, but it kind of, in my mind, fits with what we're talking about, so I wanted to call it out here. I've got this character, and it's got this attack animation. If you think back to the old Zelda games, when you had full health and swung your sword, you would send a projectile out of that sword. But the projectile didn't leave Link until mid-swing. So if you want to trigger something at a specific point in your animation, that's where these method tracks come in handy. If I add a method track to this character on my player, because that's where the code that I want to run will live, let's go over into this file and create, let's just call it row lightning. Again, using pseudocode. And now back in this method track, if I want the lightning to begin right here, mid swing, I can right click on that method track, select insert key and search for my function. And now when the playhead hits that spot in the animation, it's going to trigger this method, which by the way, to bring it back to the topic, can emit a signal. So let's say this was a ground pound instead of a sword swing, and you have an effects manager that handles particle effects. If you want to be able to tell that effects manager to put a big shock wave right where you land in that ground pound, you can go back into your event bus and define a signal called ground pound that takes the location at which you want the effect. And then back here in that throw lightning, which would probably be ground pound in the, this example, you can say events dot ground pound dot emit, and then pass along your position so that it knows where to put the effect. In your effects manager, it would be listening for that ground pound and then running code when this signal fires. This last one isn't something I use constantly, but it does come in handy in a few cases. You can use the await keyword to pause code execution until you get the signal you're looking for. In this case, we're creating a timer on the fly that takes two seconds, and when the timeout signal fires, which it will do at the end of the wait time, it will then continue. This can be handy in, I don't know, let's say you've got a game like Zelda, and when the player enters the room, you wanna give them a half a second to take stock of where the enemies are and what's going on before you give the player control. This might be a quick and dirty way to do that. This await keyword works with callables and anything that returns a signal, whether that's a built-in or a user-defined signal. I use it in my scene manager, which I will also link down below to wait for a transition to get to a certain point before moving on with the loading process. So in that case, I'm looking for the animation finished signal. Anyway, as you dig deeper into signals, I'm sure you'll find additional ways to use await and all of these others. In the interest of keeping these short, that's going to do it for today. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. It helps the channel out more than you know. And if you have subscribed, or maybe that's not your thing, please come join us in Discord. We'd all love to see what you're working on. Until next time, please be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I will see you in the next video.